Hello, everyone. Welcome to another discussion video in the discussion series we're releasing bi-weekly on Thursdays. And this one goes into, is programming necessary for security work? So, you know, in these videos, we we give our, you know, opinions up front. And my, my opinion here is not necessarily. It depends on, uh, you know, the type of job or task you're trying to do. Um, so I'll let you jump in there, Z, and, and state what you think on that. Yeah, I pretty much agree. Like, there are areas of security where programming maybe isn't necessary. That said, you're definitely putting yourself at a disadvantage by not knowing me. In this day, programming is going to help you out in so many ways, regardless of it being security. But I mean, without kind of focusing ourselves in on traditionally what you might call hacking, um, if you go back in time, like, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago, you could definitely get away without a lot of programming knowledge, just running some of the existing tooling that's out there that was being released, especially close to the 10 years ago. A lot of tools coming out, a lot of things that you can just kind of run. And companies still actually make, you know, they'll sell just an automated pen test report, you know, running whatever automated tester they've got, run that, get this report, ship it off to the client and charge them however much they want for it so you can still kind of make money you can still profit without that but i'm hoping most of our listeners actually kind of care about the skill that's part of the craft rather than just doing the bare minimum to get money uh kind of leaving yourself on the no side when it comes to that is you can make money you can actually make a good bit of progress without needing a lot of programming skill you can learn some of the basic tricks, you know, putting in a, going around the internet, putting in a single quote into a bunch of text boxes, you're probably still going to find some, maybe not as much as you would have a while back, but you're still going to find things, but you're basically just learning a bunch of tricks to do that. So like I said, that single quote, do the same thing with your angle brackets, double quotes, whatever, look for cross-site scripting, um, looking for IDOR type issues again, just change a number in a URL. Like you could learn these tricks, you can do them, you can find plenty of issues that way and actually be fairly fairly productive doing that. But there's the skill ceiling. Um, no matter what you do, if you're not able to do any programming, if you're not able to do any of that work yourself, you're just limiting yourself. Yeah, I mean, the, the problem with tricks is it's easy to miss issues that wouldn't be caught by using those common tricks. And that's like, you know, as soon as you use that trick, you don't really know how to augment it or modify it to potentially find an issue that could still exist. It's just not as easily hittable yeah, because I mean, they have some kind of filter in front of it or something that's maybe not adequate, but is adequate enough to prevent those tricks from doing anything. Yeah, that's kind of the thing. It's that part of that, that skill ceiling that I was mentioning is you're not at the point of being able to hit the harder vulnerabilities if you're just doing those tricks. Uh, I mean, it is traditionally like what I would call a script kitty who's doing that, even if they are manually uh, doing some of these exploits. I do think with the advent of web exploitation, script kitty has kind of lost its meaning just because of how how the web has kind of impacted vulnerabilities versus when people were just kind of running around with existing existing kind of released exploit scripts um that said i mean you you kind of put yourself into that sort of category you're not you're not providing much value you're just kind of you can still be productive though is i guess my main point like you can be productive but your value really isn't there it's about as valuable as any other company just running an automated scanner so there are some areas where I think programming isn't really necessary. And uh, what came to mind when I was thinking of this was on the last podcast we did, which was episode 48, uh, we we covered cloud security stuff, you know, with AWS and talked about IAM permissions and stuff like that. Managing those kinds of permissions, I would still consider security and you don't really need programming experience to do. Um, though I think programming experience might be beneficial for doing that, but I don't think you absolutely need it. Well, so so that, that was one area I was kind of thinking of. Even on that podcast episode, they uh, use some programming to automate uh, enumerating the various um, various roles that they were able to access and definitely made heavy use of programming skill in order to do uh, or in order to pull up their attack. 
I mean, you setting it up on the defensive side, sure, but actually I'd argue that on the defensive side, programming becomes a little bit more necessary. You could do that particular task without it. But anybody who's doing that task is probably doing a lot more of the sysadmin side things too, which you're probably going to want at least kind of your daily driver scripting language for. Uh, that said, I, I don't really want to focus on like the defensive side too much. Uh, just because I haven't worked, well, I worked as a developer with some security folks, but I haven't really worked on that blue side too actively. Yeah, that's fair. Um, my main point, though, is when it comes to auditing, like code review and stuff like that, it becomes a lot more important. You know, with, with code review especially, it's it's kind of in the name. Um, you know, like you were saying earlier, there are some automated things where you might not necessarily need it, you know, when you're getting into, like, running Metasploit modules and stuff like that. But especially when it comes to building tools for pen testing, uh, building scanners, fuzzers, that kind of stuff, um, you definitely need programming experience to be able to do. Um, and even if you're just running tools and not necessarily building them, you want to be able to understand what you're looking at when you find things or you get reports from automated tooling so that you can triage it. And, you know, in order to do that, you, you probably do need to understand the code to some degree. Yeah, that's actually, I think, a really important point on the building fuzzers, kind of jumping back a little bit, but automation. So I'm, we're talking about fuzzers right now, but um, other areas, like in terms of more general pen tasks, so if you go more on the network security side of things, you still need to automate. Like there's so much more automation going on when it comes to recon and stuff. Um, and just as part of the normal tasks, like there's a lot of automation that happens that you're really at a disadvantage if you can't develop your own tooling just to hit some endpoint to enumerate something whatever so as, as we we're even saying with the cloud thing like they use some of the they wrote a script to enumerate what was available um through the im rules uh so i mean like the programming you know is going to augment everything and these days i think you know fuzzing especially on the exploit development side of things and vulnerability research Fuzzing has kind of become the key thing that, yes, I mean, manual auditing is still essential, but having the fuzzer going, having a fuzzer giving you some findings has just become a standard part of the process now uh, that you basically, you need programming in order to be able to do that. Just even on like a small, uh, small little project, you know, a little web app, you just quickly script up all of the endpoints you've got and toss a quick fuzzer at it, see what happens. Uh, so, I mean, it's definitely essential there. Going back there on your second point about triaging. Um, yeah, I mean, when you're... That also, uh, I guess that triaging from the crashes, knowing the results of any of the scans. So, while I do kind of hate on the companies that just provide, like, a scan report, scans are valuable. There's a chance that it might notice something you missed, but it's also... It's just kind of a safety net in a sense like you just run it you see what it gives you and it might give you some place to start looking at manually and being able to understand the results and kind of uh like the term grok or intuitively understand the results being able to look at those results and then work off of that so when it comes to the triaging you definitely need that when you're looking at a crash dump or something but when it also just comes to the output of any of a scan any scanners like you might understand that saying like hey here's an issue and here's kind of what happens but how you take advantage of that issue to actually do something important is kind of where it can help to have the programming knowledge to understand how the application might be built what components they maybe trust and just kind of have that visualization and as i said before that intuitive understanding yeah so overall i think even though programming might not be necessary for every type of job it's an overall benefit and there's no reason not to learn it um, because it's only going to benefit you, right? It's not going to draw back on you at all, really. Um, I, I do kind of want to clarify, though, when we say, you know, knowing programming and stuff, I don't mean, you know, you, you need to become a full fledged software engineer knowing like, you know, the ins and outs of CS and algorithms and all that stuff. Um, unless you're auditing something that's specifically entrenched in those areas of like algorithms and whatnot. Um, I think for whatever reason, people think that if you don't know all the ins and outs of like DevOps and, and software engineering that you can't do security. And I think that's a little bit too far past the line. Um, I just don't think that's true at all for most cases. Yeah, for a lot of security, I mean, you're not, 
you need to have a general understanding about how applications are built, kind of what's going on behind the scenes, especially when you're dealing with like a black box environment where you see the UI, but you haven't really gone in or you can't in some cases reverse engineer the actual code, but you can look at what's happening on the front and be like, okay, this is probably this in the back end, how this kind of works, how this fits together. So you need to understand how applications are kind of built or how networks are configured on like the network security side of things. You don't need to be like the greatest programmer and being like a amazing programmer doesn't translate into security ability either. Uh, no doubt having that understanding helps, but I mean, there's kind of the diminishing returns at a certain point. Once you kind of have your basics down, security becomes reasonably accessible. Like if you could build a similar app to what you're targeting, um, and by similar, I do mean like much lesser quality, you know, like I don't expect you to know how to write like a full scale Linux kernel uh, before you can actually start attacking it. But like if you understand the basics of operating systems, it's at least approachable to you, then you can start jumping into the security side of things. And a point I'll throw on there, too, is just the the programmer way of, you know, thinking and problem solving in and of itself uh, can be useful for figuring how to how figuring out how somebody would like try to circumvent permissions or something, for example. So even where programming isn't used directly, what it teaches you and and the way of thinking it it you know molds you to to think. I, I think that could be transferable. So yeah, and I guess one other thing is you know if you're doing a code review, you kind of need to know how to program. Part of the thing is actually on that note, you don't. You don't necessarily need to be, as we've already said, like the most amazing programmer out there. You do kind of need some experience with different languages, though. Usually somebody who's done security isn't just going to know one language. I think some areas you can kind of get away with a single language where it comes down to like automating a recon and stuff. You can maybe get away with just some like Python or like that daily drive language. Uh, but when it comes, if you're doing kind of the code review level, doing, doing stuff at that level, you kind of need to have an understanding of several different languages uh, rather than just one, but um, you'll start noticing a lot of similarities between languages, so you're kind of able to pick things up really quickly once you've kind of started learning one or two languages. Um, I tend to recommend like a, um, a native language like C and then learn object-oriented because it's used all over in enterprise code, .NET stuff is using it, Java stuff. Um, so like you see those two a lot and then a functional language to kind of be an edge case on some of the other weird things you might run into and that kind of catches you up on uh, most things you're going to run into in terms of like doing code reviews. Uh, you'll be able to pick up almost any language if you kind of have those fundamentals. So our next video will be going into programming languages and you know which ones are good to know for security and for what reasons and stuff like that. So keep a lookout for that in uh, in the next two weeks' time. That way, you know you can you can get kind of both parts to uh, this discussion. That said, I think on this discussion specifically, we'll we'll wrap it up here. Uh, unless you have any last minute thoughts, see. No, I guess I would just end off by saying if you want to actually you know get good and have some decent skill, which I think you should probably aim for yes just start learning to program if you don't know that already all right so i'll end it off by saying we do have our uh, day zero podcast if some of you you know haven't heard of that uh we we run those on monday at 3 p.m eastern 12 p.m pacific so check those out if you haven't already we also have these discussion videos every two weeks on thursdays uh usually they're released around the morning i think around 8 a.m or so is when we try to get them out so keep a lookout for those other than that though we will see you guys in the next discussion video.